Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 30 of The Bottom Line. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Syed, and we have another athlete uh, episode ready for you guys today. Um, as usual, as usual, we're going to kick things off with Syed's tech updates, and we're also going to focus uh, this week's episode on uh, the cryptocurrencies, which are seeing a tremendous sustained rally. Um, we'll be focusing our discussion today on Solana, Chainlink, XRP, and other altcoins. And we're also going to talk about a couple other things that we see going on more specifically, um, Uber rides and Lyft rides, which are getting more expensive. So we're going to try to go in deeper and see what the reason for that is. And we're also going to talk about the UAE's interesting approach for kickstarting their economy in the post-COVID era. Um, we're also going to end things off with our, our stock picks for the upcoming trading week. So again, lots to cover in this week's episode. Uh, with that being said, Syed, the floor is yours to the tech up here. Thank you, Deepak, for the introduction. Um, it is episode 30. We reached 30 episodes so far, so it's a great milestone for us. And as usual, let's get started and inform you guys of the latest in the technology and security world. So um, and first, I wanted to talk about uh, Focus, which is a uh, which is New Zealand's third larger third largest internet provider. They said that it responded to a cyber attack. Uh, that temporarily triggered a widespread internet outage. Um, and they, the company said that um, its systems blocked the denial of service, which is also known as a, a, um, a DDoS attack on one, uh, on one user. But in doing so, it caused some bogus customers in, in the country's largest cities, Auckland, Wellington, Church Christ, to suffer outages. Bogus said the issue was resolved in, within 30 minutes. So. For those of you, like our viewers are mostly in Canada or the US, so it's, this is similar to say Rogers or Bell suffering a um, D DDoS attack and you're not having internet for like 30 minutes or something. Um, and this, so this was, I found this interesting. Um, so it could happen anywhere and uh, this is why um, it's important to, to educate yourself about security because uh, sometimes you wonder, right, why, um, like where these attackers are gonna, uh, like wh wh who these attackers are targeting, right? Um, um, and uh, internet service providers is a major target for these uh, for these bad guys, quote unquote. So I uh, thought I'd let our viewers know about that. Um, next, uh, FBI. The FBI is warning of ransomware attacks targeting food and agriculture uh, sector as White House pu pushes for proactive measures. Um, so basically, the FBI sent out this notice warning companies in the food and agriculture sector to watch out for ransomware attacks aiming to disrupt supply chains. The FBI notes that ransomware groups are seeking to disrupt operations, cause financial loss, and negatively impact the food supply chain. Um, and then the article also goes on about how the ransomware can impact business across sector from small farms to large producers, pr processors, manufacturers, and market markets and restaurants. And that cyber criminal, their actors exploit network vulnerabilities to exfiltrate the data and encrypt systems in, in, in a sector that is increasing, increasingly uh, reliant on smart technologies, industrial control systems, and internet-based automation systems. That's what the SP, FBI basically said. This article goes in uh, more detail about what, uh, what the SP, FBI had to say about this, but um, I thought I'd let, let our viewers know. And this article came out on September 3rd, so last week. Um, and uh, we're gonna stay with the White House here. So uh, they are basically, uh, they basically uh, said that, um, and this was on September 2nd. Now the long weekend's pretty much over. Today is September 6th, but they said on September 2nd that the White House, uh, the White House is doubling down on warning about cyber attacks over the holidays. So the White House Deputy National Security Advisor, Annie Neuberger, um, on Thursday urged U.S. organizations to be on guard against the malicious digital activity ahead of the Labor Day holiday. And quote, she said, we want to raise awareness and this need for awareness is particularly for critical infrastructure owners and operator, operators who operate critical service for Americans. Um, although this is like only for Americans, I, I'm pretty sure the Canadian government also knows about this, but um, yeah, um, the, the long weekends are a perfect time for cyber criminals to act, right? Um, they can set up like phishing campaigns, social engineering and everything, right? And um, they can catch people off guard because say if someone's on vacation during this time, right? They won't be as alert, right? And they can, they can get fished easily or, or, or stuff like that. So I'm happy that the governments are actually taking note into this and telling people that um, this is a time where cyber attacks usually increase, right? And for companies and people to be more um, vigilant and like more more aware of what's going on. 
and not to like not to um not to click on anything and on, on that note so um yeah an interesting read and also a good awareness and educational um article there next up uh talk about microsoft exchange and they have a another bug that's called proxy token and it allows emo snooping um it's basically um it, it so it, the bug cve 2021-33766 it's basically an informational dis information disclosure issue that could reveal victims personal information sensitive company data and more um and basically uh there the, the issue arises specifically in a feature called the delegated authentication where the front end passes authentication requests directly to the back end and these requests contain a security token cookie that identify them um so that's basically at a high level and what has microsoft done about it well basically it was reported as a zero day initiative by researcher Lee Swan uh to Guan of vptinc uh, which is a company and um a cyber security research uh researching company and it was passed by microsoft in july um but it, it it's basically a zero day and basically they're rolling out their patches that's why companies should exchange uh should patch their uh microsoft exchange um, uh, exchange servers as soon as possible uh we're sticking with microsoft here and uh for gamers out there um they may have just revealed android app support for the xbox so uh essentially uh what happened is that a new microsoft store listing points to xbox consoles getting android support android app support um i should say um and the store uh is listing for the windows subsystem for android specifically list the F xbox one and the microsoft source has since says android apps aren't coming to the xbox but this uh, this um article basically hints otherwise so we'll see what happens on the road um now we're going to switch over to apple so they're exploring um they're exploring uh, risk v which is basically um a type of processor basically um uh, basically so what what happened is that um as you may or may not know apple switched um switched its pcs to arm based uh, arm based processors right uh last year so all their new macs are, are arm based now instead of intel based right um but the company isn't putting all the eggs into one basket as it's also exploring the emerging open source ricv architecture and this week the company posted a job alert for this high performance uh, for RIC RISCV high performance programmer and Apple is currently looking for an experienced programmer with detailed knowledge of this um, of this architecture and um, basically um, it's it, it's it's making questions basically because known for its secrecy right Apple's listing doesn't disclose what exactly it plans to do with this with this architecture but the job description indicates that the programmer will have to work with machine learning comp computational vision and natural language uh, processing um so maybe they're uh like it, it, it's interesting because um it, it, it they switch from they switch from intel to arm and now they're also looking into this open source architecture so um it, it wouldn't surprise me if they're they're thinking ahead and they they want to leverage this open source platform for something bigger and better in the future so um it's apple you know so um that's why i found this interesting and i thought i'd let our viewers know um and and then to end off my tech update and i'll talk more about this in our crypto segment um but open c which is an nft platform they um they announced that um they trade they they in august they they earned more than 3.4 billion um as their nft sales um it like went like, like they hit all-time highs basically as they um recorded over 3.4 billion dollars in transactions across 1.67 million nfts so well, again we'll talk more about this in our um in our in our next segment but um that wraps up the tech update for episode 30. All right, perfect. So thanks so much for that tech update, Syed. Uh, just move, before we move on to our, our main segment, which is uh, based on the cryptocurrency market that's uh, seeing a massive rise over the last few weeks, I wanted to actually briefly jump into a few other things that uh, are noteworthy to me. Um, the first of which is uh, coming from this article on CNBC, which we'll provide in the link in the description. Um, it's titled, Uber and Lyft rides are more expensive than ever because of a driver shortage. So if you're someone who actually has been taking Uber and Lyft, you've probably noticed the prices for a single ride have gone up almost astronomically since uh, the start of the pandemic, right? So 
this article really tries to explore what that is. Um, the cost of a ride from a ride sharing app like Uber and Lyft increased 92% between January 2018 and July 2021. Um, many riders also noticed increased wait times for rides. Um, the main reason behind both, uh, it appears, is a shortage of drivers. So in early July 2021, so about two months ago now, Uber and Lyft drivers were about 40% below normal capacity. So the companies have taken notice and are investing millions uh, worth of bonuses and base rates to convince drivers to return. Um, but to turn things around, these ride-sharing companies might need to do even more to convince them. Because if you think about it, there's so much stimulus that's been in the market for the last little while uh, that continues to come, really. It hasn't even halted yet. Um, and, and I think a lot of small businesses are also facing labor shortages because if you're getting a check for $2,000 a month, let's say, hypothetically, if you're being paid a minimum wage salary, is is the trade-off really worth it? And for a lot of uh, a lot of individuals, it might not be the case, right? right. So that's sort of funneling into our economy where, uh, like I, I just meant, small businesses, restaurants, retail, um, they're facing the brunt of it. And then these ride sharing programs as well, right? So Uber's website actually displays uh, that drivers make anywhere between $22 per hour in cities like Orlando to $37 an hour in cities like New York. Um, Lyft has a long list of incentives and bonuses for drivers, but like for those who are still relying on ride sharing platforms to make a living, the companies uh, are still not offering enough compared to the cost of living, right? So um, if you look at it, the driver shortage really calls into question whether the whole ride sharing business model altogether is sustainable. Um, Uber especially has been known for um, not being able to show sustained profits and has instead uh, been showing staggering losses compared with most other publicly traded companies. For example, um, Uber actually lost $6.77 billion last year and $8.51 billion in 2019, which was the last full year actually before the pandemic even started. Um, Lyft, as a comparison, lost $1.75 billion last year and $2.6 billion in 2019, although last quarter it was profitable for the first time on an adjusted EBITDA basis. Uh, which ignores costs like stock-based compensation and, and taxes, amongst others. So really, like you're, you're seeing, for, there, there's two aspects of it. First of all, we always question whether the business model that Uber was operating on was actually sustainable and that was being reflected in its stock price. Granted, it had a little bit of a rally with the rest of the broad, ma uh, broad market increasing, but it was always questionable how sustainable those models were. And really the pandemic threw a wrench in it because even though they were trimming their losses for a period of time, um, first of all, ride sharing wasn't even going on in, in the start of the pandemic because everyone was locked down. And now that things have opened up again, people are looking to travel, but there's the minimum pay grade just aren't willing to come into work right now. So it, it's kind of like a double-edged sword that they're facing. Um, and it'll be interesting to see like what the future of these companies is because eventually you're going to have to turn this into a profitable company, right? You can't have um, losses running into indefinitely for any of these businesses, right? So it'll be interesting how much they'll actually have to turn up the compensation to bring drivers back in. What's the, what effect that's going to have on their bottom line? And again, if that's an increased cost, like what's the ultimate price going to be for a consumer in order for them to actually be profitable, right? So these are a multitude of facts that we have to take into consideration and it'll go back into our inflation concerns, right? We, we talk about inflation being transitory, but if something like this, you see a, you see an underlying problem. I don't necessarily think it's transitory, right? There's, there's something more deep rooted here and it'll be interesting to see how that trickles into other aspects of our economy. So uh, just something that interesting that caught my eye, I thought I'd share that with our viewers. Yeah, to add on to that, um, I think um, the pandemic has obviously a major role to play in this because obviously like you don't want like um, people sitting in your own car, right? Without knowing like if they're fully immune to this virus or not. And um, I wonder if Uber or like these uh, ride sharing companies are, uh, they would put like a uh, mandatory vaccine policy where like, if you want to like ride in, in an Uber or something, you have to show proof of vaccination. Um, Cause you, yeah. you see like every, the government's doing it, every, other companies doing it. So just for the, the safety of their drivers and for them to lure their, um, previous employees or not employees, but drivers back from 
pre pre COVID and like um, additional drivers as well. Um, I think this is a step they might need to take. Just uh, just what I think, but um, uh, yeah, from, yeah, from the, that's it. yeah. No, like I think that's interesting, but it's also going to sort of isolate them from another segment of the market because, like in the states, they don't have the vaccination rates that we do here in Canada. I think they're still yeah. at around fifty percent. So if they mandate the vaccine, that's about 50% of the total addressable market that they've sort of like removed from their total pool, right? So again, like I, I don't think it's an easy decision for them to make for sure either way. So it's definitely a situation that we want to keep monitoring as well. Yep, for sure. Perfect. So like I, I also wanted to briefly mention another article that's on CNBC and that's uh, regarding the UAE's uh, decision to announce 50 initiatives um, to boost their economy uh, following this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but businesses are still awaiting more details, so they're still finalizing that. They've just announced um, that there's more initiatives to come. So uh, just to, again, summarize this article, um, the UAE has launched a series of programs to stimulate and diversify its economy, seeking to attract some $150 billion in new foreign investment in the company, coming decade. So, again, being cognizant of the fact that Dubai has over, not, not even Dubai, the entire UAE, actually has thrived based on foreign investment over the past decade or so, right? So yeah. you can see how far along we've come and they're, they're continuing to try to attract uh, big money. Um, but yeah, so 50 new projects and initiatives will be announced in the coming weeks. Um, Emirati officials said to coincide with the country's 50th anniversary, including new visas to attract residents and skilled workers. So, and I quote, the UAE's drive for the next 50 years is to become a global player across different industries. Um, the region is what we've been targeting for the past five decades. Now we're moving on to ensure that a lot of our sectors are competitive on a global level. So the country aims to invest more heavily in advanced industry sectors and technology education. Um, newly introduced changes include visa schemes like the green visa, uh, which is meant to expand self-residency status for skilled individuals and investors, and the freelancers visa, which will enable the self-employed to sponsor themselves. The country has already int introduced the 10-year golden visa, which granted selectivity uh, to the highly skilled and select residents and investors. Um, visas are a core pillar of the UAE economy as nearly 90% of its population of over 10 million are, are, are from foreign or, or, or from abroad, right? Um, traditionally, without a job, they actually lose their visa, but this was a reason behind nearly 10% of the country's population leaving over the first year of the coronavirus pandemic. So a lot of people there, again, have come on visas. They expire because they don't have a job due to the pandemic. They have to go back, right? So that, that's, why, that's what they're really summarizing here in this article. That's had a negative effect on their economy. Um, but really what they're trying to do now is, is to introduce more flexible visas so that if you're, if you're in a skilled trade or you have certain background in terms of your education, you have a longer runway to find a job um, in order to maintain your visa or, or become a permanent resident, right? And this is different from like working in Europe, let's say, for example, where it's very difficult to actually renew your visa or, or stay there on a long-term basis becoming a permanent resident. They want to make the UAE in general more favorable for someone leaving their country to come in and uh, again, contribute to their economy, right? So this is just one of them. There's a lot more incentives that they're gonna come up with and that's going to be released over the next few weeks. So we'll, we'll definitely share that um, as we get more information. But they're again, they're trying to make it more employee friendly so that everyone kind of gravitates towards um, Dubai and the UAE specifically. Um, trying to, I think, I think what they're trying to do is position it as another technology hub, yeah. right? And, and you can see what's what's going on in California as a tech hub in the states. I think that's where they envision things headed. Um, in the UAE. So it'll be interesting how they transition. Um, right now, like I, previously, they were known for, again, being the, like the king of oil, right? So yeah. um, I think as we transition into a world where we're, we want to be more green and, and oil might not necessarily have the future that we thought it would, especially with EVs and whatnot mm -hmm. coming yeah. out, um, they're going to have to transition into something else. And I think where they're headed is, is the tax sector. So that's why they're trying to build build that up, build the foundation, make that more of a hub. And, and obviously it's a great place to tour if you've been to somewhere like Dubai. Um, cost of living is obviously high, so they're trying to make it favorable for employees to want to come there. Um, and, and again, like just start and live their lives. So definitely we'll, we'll keep you guys posted on, on what exactly they're proposing. 
Um, right now, they haven't given the details. We just said that it's going to be released over the coming week. So we'll keep an eye on that and update you accordingly. Yeah, I think the pandemic uh, did have an impact on this, but overall, it's hard for, um, say, for example, like you compare it to Europe, right? But like, um, even if you compare it to North America, if like you immigrate there, it's really hard to get citizenship, even PR. I'm yeah. not too sure about PR, but it's really hard to get citizenship there, as if like Canada, US. I don't, I'm not too sure about Europe as a whole, but it's it's much easier yeah. to get a citizenship or even a PR in, in the UAE. You just have like a work permit and you still hold your native country's passport. Um, you can't get there passport unless if you like um like, like uh get get a spouse there or something like a local spouse there or like uh, marry someone from there um so those are stuff that, that's something like i think they might consider changing i'm not too sure but uh definitely we'll keep you guys updated and see uh, because they need to recover from uh the loss right of people and like um get their economy back up so uh yeah definitely interesting all right so moving on to our main segment of today again we wanted to address the cryptocurrency market um one thing that we've uh, constantly been checking on on previous episodes of the bottom line here is the market cap which is critically important because we've got to realize um the market cap of all the other altcoins are basically capped at uh, Bitcoin's market cap, right? So um, we don't anticipate any other any of the other coins overtaking Bitcoin in terms of market cap in this cycle. That that might change in future bull runs, but for this cycle, we we don't anticipate any of these altcoins surpassing Bitcoin's market cap. So inherently, there's there's a wall on all of that. Um, but again, if, if there's upward movement in Bitcoin, then you can suspect that, hey, the altcoins will have uh, a sizable run up as well. And in terms of percentages, you might actually see larger gains. Um, so, again, like looking at uh, the cryptocurrencies right now, we're, we're focused here really on the top 10. Um, and, and we can see over the last seven days, you can you can notice Ethereum's run up by almost 20 percent, being up 18.83 percent, I believe, over the last week. Um, XRP is another one up 23.5%. Um, Solana, which is just incredible, is up 43% uh, over the last seven days. And then we also have uh, Polkadot here at almost 30% up. So again, these are the main altcoins that uh, we've we've been talking about in previous episodes and by market cap as well. These are some of the largest coins and they, they're also some of the oldest altcoins. So you can rest assured knowing that uh, they'll probably be around for the next cycle as well. Um, but we, we really wanted to focus our discussion here. And I know, Saeed, you have a lot to talk about, about uh, yeah. the altcoins I just mentioned. So I, I won't step on your toes here. <laughs> but we did want to focus um, on XRP, on Solana, and all, on Polkadot, Chainlink. Those ones in particular, um, because they have seen a sizable run up. Um, there's a little bit of FOMO, I, I think, in the markets right now. But for these altcoins, I think there's a lot of fundamental strength that's backing these upward price movements. So... Um, well, that's being said, said I'll flip it to you and, and just wanted to pick your brain here on what you think is going on with uh, these altcoins in particular. Yeah, uh, before I get into the altcoin section, I wanted to talk about Ethereum and its uh, circulating supply here, which could impact its price overall because with Ethereum 2.0 coming in, um, it, the uh, and proof of stake, that's going to reduce the amount of circulating supply for Ethereum. So don't be surprised if the price goes up. Um, because if there's less supply and there's more demand, right, um, and there's more volume, then that means like um, the price is going to go up. Just like as you see for Bitcoin, right, there's such a low, like there's a low supply here, right? So um, that, that being said, like right now, Ethereum supply is like 117 million. Um, so with, like this, this number, I expect to decrease as Ethereum 2.0 and uh, proof of stake um, uh, comes along in the future, in the near future, I should say. Um, with that being said, though, um, let's get straight into it and talk about um, and talk about what I um, talk about crypto and in the world of crypto. Before getting into the main topics of crypto, I just wanted to tell our viewers that um, and this just came out like today. So Monday, September 6, 2021, about like two hours ago. But the global crypto exchange cross tower. Um, it's entering India despite policy uncertainty. So we talked about this before as um, crypt crypto has a hard ban in India, right? Um, but this exchange is um, looking for, looking to expand into India, basically. So um, that, I found this interesting, so thought I would talk about that real quick. Once again, article will be in the description below, but... Um, this this exchange uh, this I found this really interesting and we'll see how the market reacts to this. But uh, let's talk about XRP. So um, XRP has been up 
um, has been up, as you saw in the in the in the in the screen share um, a few seconds ago, as Deepak mentioned. And basically, uh, what what what's happening is that uh, with XRP is the lawsuit, basically, right? Um, and its fundamental side. So um, the Ripple SEC case in the U.S. And basically, just to recap. Uh, those of you that don't know, the case alleges Ripple to have sold XRP as an un unlicensed security for years with uh, with the founding team pocketing billions of dollars as a result. But it's progressed favorably for Ripple in the past few months. And there are two dates in October, um, and I believe this month too. And I'll let you know those two dates for sure. Are, um, but those two dates are very important for Ripple as the lawsuit is set to be finalized um, in the next upcoming month or so in the, in the next few weeks actually i should say so those two dates are really important and once again i'll make a i'll make a post about that on our social media to let our viewers know um because that could be the point where xrp could um once the lawsuit is cleared then they can um then they can basically live up to their fundamentals and what they offer um so yeah that's, it's, that's it's, it, it's one of the few coins that isn't at all-time highs now right because exactly. Lost. Exactly. Yeah. It's all time high was back in 2018, actually, but um, yeah. um, because of this lawsuit, um, it's kind of, it's kind of like, yeah. it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a roadblock, I guess you can say. But I, like you said, there is FOMO right now, and I think that's the reason why it's up right now. But once this lawsuit clears, even like if the all other coins are doing bad at that time in the future, I believe Ripple will react strongly to the lawsuit result if it goes in their favor, of course. And as, as it seems right now, it is going in their favor. So um, once again, the fundamentals in Ripple are there. Um, the XRP project is really good. Um, and without going into too much detail of how XRP works, which we, we which, which we can explain in the future if our viewers are interested, but uh, the fundamentals are there, solid use case. So with that being said, once this clears and it goes in their favor, um, Ripple, the potential is really high. Um, another altcoin, uh, Chainlink. So uh, apart from XRP, which I just talked about, Chainlink led the big gains uh, today in the morning. So Monday morning, Labor Day. Uh, the token rose over 11% to $33 um, and becoming the 13th largest cryptocurrency by a market cap of uh, $14.9 billion. So um, you can always look at the charts um, as uh, it reached a price level last seen in uh, May 2021 and uh, March 2021 before that. So the token saw a price rejection both times as it reached those these levels, meaning that the trend to remain in place, it should continue to surge and close above 37 dollars um, and as such the token has long to go before reaching its all-time high of 53 dollars but um, back to the fundamentals though why is it why is it um, why is it doing so good obviously it's a bull market and all that but we've talked about X uh, not XRP sorry chain link um, briefly but essentially what it is it's, is it links the crypto the crypto um, the crypto blockchain and the outside world mm -hmm. together at, at a very high level that's what it does and it, it, it the link token powers the chain link decentralized Oracle network one that is increasingly seeing adoption across both DeFi and traditional finance projects just last week um, Chainlink saw uh, price feeds go live on the Optimize, uh, Optimism uh, Ethereum and Solana, while institutional developments outside Switzerland saw easier investment access for institutions to Chainlink. So again, use cases are there, potential is there. Um, right now, there might be a little bit of uh, um, FOMO, uh, people just buying in and stuff. But um, if you just look at the bare fundamentals of that, and obviously the technical analysis, which is obviously not my expertise, but if you just um, if you just merge those two um, do two things together and um, do your due diligence when researching about uh, Chainlink, whether if you should invest in it or not, um, these are some of just some of the things that you should consider. And there's definitely a use case for Chainlink. And if you guys want to learn more about Chainlink, feel free to reach out to us and we'll make a exclusive episode just on chain link and we can we can talk about that um and then obviously you saw doge and all those coins going up too and that's definitely part of the meme and stuff um like as always um it's just it, it's still there shiba inu is of the world doge um not sure how safe moon's doing to be honest i think it's 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 it's, it's extinct now but i could be wrong but she uh, but uh safe moon fans if you're invested let us know uh, down in the comments below if it's still if it's still alive if you made gains if you've lost your money uh, not too sure and once again this is not financial advice this is for educational or entertainment purposes only
thought I'd uh, make that clear. <laughs> um, and uh, um, and then we also have Solana as well. And I know Deepak, you wanted to um, talk about Solana too. Um, I know that we were talking uh, uh, the other day and uh, you were asking me about Solana and um, we mentioned this before, right? So Solana, um, Solana has uh, Solana is a like has a it, it's a really great project because it's it's basically going to be the Ethereum killer and that's what they're calling it. and I totally agree with that because um, its blockchain is just as efficient but faster um, than Ethereum and then obviously you don't have to deal with the gas prices and all that um, and then also uh, Solana also has an NFT like you can you can build NFTs on there so OpenSea um, I know I mentioned OpenSea um, and like they're huge huge um their huge earnings right um are based off nfts and the tech update but the reason i mentioned that was because open c is based on ethereum right now and you still have to pay those high gas prices now in solana um it's not as easy to set up nfts as of now you have to use something called apis which i won't get into too much in detail because i gotta look into myself how to do it but essentially you have to set up apis and then deploy your nft from there onto, onto the solana blockchain um so it's not as user friendly as you can say, but it's still there. And as they make progress um, and more and more people get into the NFT hype on the Solana blockchain, um, don't be surprised if Solana rises even more. Um, and then obviously the transaction per second, we mentioned this before in the previous episode, I believe it was 28 or 29 when we talked about transaction per second and how Solana, um, Solana just just is on top of transaction per second, right? Uh, even faster than Ripple. I believe it, it was like, um, 35, 10,000 times faster than Bitcoin, 4,000 times faster than Ethereum, uh, 35 times thousand, uh, um, 35 times faster than Ripple, and I believe faster than Visa too. I believe, um, from what I remember. Um, but, uh, that, those are just some of the reasons why it's going up. And once again, like, there is like a lot of like, um, uh, FOMO right now um, in the market um, and that's why maybe it's going up but like fundamental wise again I always look at the fundamentals of the project um, it's 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 the the lights are really bright at the end of the tunnel I guess you can say and you don't, you don't know when the tunnel ends because they still got a long way to go and it's all looking positive in my book so um, that's that's what I wanted to pretty much cover um, and uh, uh, just one more thing actually I wanted to cover and this came out again today but Coinbase is, uh, is to use Polygon's Ethereum scaling solution to reduce prices settle, um, uh, to reduce prices so again back to the gas prices and Ethereum's, pro Ethereum's uh, scaling uh, problem right because they have so many um, they have so, such high gas prices and Coinbase relies on Ethereum blockchain right so essentially like Polygon Matic we talked about that before that token on the ethereum network is set to scale ethereum and like make gas prices um less so what's happening is basically an engineering team at the u.s cryptocurrency exchange coinbase plans to integrate polygon's layer 2 scaling solution for ethereum with the exchange platform this move basically marks a first for coinbase protocol team which will attempt to reduce high prices and long settlement times according to a press release on tuesday um so this was last tuesday uh, last week tuesday um uh, so six days ago and integrating with coinbase will allow exchange users to withdraw directly on a supported l2 solution and an exact date for the l2 integration has not been made public yet but the coinbase protocol team is experienced is in is an experienced group of engineers aiming to contribute to the scaling of blockchains and community building and the team focuses on integrating various technologies with coinbase products and basically the aim is to help level the playing field while ensuring retail users don't get priced out of being able to participate in this budget ecosystem right according to the release because right now the gas prices and fees are insane like um i i, I prefer coinbase pro but even on there the the, the fees are kind of like they're high but like normal coinbase they're extremely high um but like this will certainly help to improve the coinbase user experience that Paul and polygon's co-founder sandeep and uh, noval and uh, basically last month, Polygon merged with the roll-up platform Hermes Network in a $250 million deal, making it the first complete merger, merger of one blockchain network into another. So we're talking about Polygon Matic too, and that's that's definitely another token. Um, again, it's on it's an ERC-20 to token, which is on the Ethereum network, but it's definitely a project uh, that has a very bright future. Um, and I guess the future is now, as you can say, right, um, for it. So yeah, I wanted to close out with that. Um, but Deepak, I know if you wanted to add on something, like if you had any thoughts on Solana or anything, uh, feel free to add on. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think you did a good job of covering everything here. Like, again, Solana is just so much faster. Transaction fees are lower. I, I think that's like one of the main things that everyone's looking at from a fundamental standpoint, right? And um, I, I think what I'll leave off this segment with is the fact that when the fundamentals are strong, the price action will follow. So um, when, when you're looking at investing, if you're a long-term investor, don't, don't necessarily worry about what the price is doing on a day-to-day, -day, especially with a volatile market like the crypto market is. Um, just be comfortable knowing that the fundamentals are there. And if the fundamentals are there, then you're going to enjoy profits in the long run, hopefully, right? So uh, I'll, I'll just end off the segment with that. Um, there, we can go at length about all of yeah. these projects. We'll or talk about this again, yeah, definitely in the future as uh, crypto isn't going anywhere. But um, hope our viewers found this um, found this uh, interesting and uh, they learned something from here. And yeah, we'll definitely talk more about this. And if there's any other coin our viewers, um, so you guys want to learn about or, or for us to talk about, um, or like even like stock market, for example, any stock or like anything in the stock market you want us to talk about, cover in depth, uh, we can do that for you. Um, of course, for educational purposes um, only and entertainment purposes. Uh, like we're not going to tell you to invest in safe moon or or dogecoin <laughs> don't worry right but, uh you could if you want to but <laughs> we don't tell you to do that um but yeah um we'll uh we'll move on now to our stock picks now all right so that's a perfect transition actually because we're going to talk about our stock picks next um my stock pick for the upcoming trading week is actually um riot blockchain so again it's a bitcoin miner um one of the most popular ones actually because it's 52 week high as you can see below is almost 80 dollars so we, we did see quite a significant pullback. Uh, it's now $34. But again, with, with the crypto market heating up, I think I wanted to just, just uh, bring this back to everyone's attention. So again, last trading day was a little rough for, for Riot because they actually did have a share offering going on. And as you, as people know, with share offerings, there's dilution, and that usually has a negative impact on stock price. But again, like looking at uh, looking at the chart here, side, so if we can move uh, to the one-month chart first. Yeah. Um, we, we can see again, like it's down 8.99% and then go to six months quickly. Yes, sir. Again, yeah, so six month chart down almost 12%, right? So I, I think what you're seeing from a, from a technical standpoint is a little bit of a base here um, with, with the price action sort of playing around that range of between 30 and $40 a share. Um, as a swing trade, I'd say you want to watch this level. So again, you, you want it to at least hold 30 from a psychological standpoint. Um, but if you do do go in, um, again, set your own stop losses when you go in. But I, 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 I suspect um, there will be a breakout soon, especially with Bitcoin starting to pick up steam. And, and obviously, this is a Bitcoin play here. So if you're unable to buy BTC directly, this is one of the ways you can get exposure to the crypto market. So definitely keep an eye out on this one. Yeah, pro tip, it's on sale. Again, not financial advice, but it's on sale right now. Um, so uh, you should like look into it and uh, uh, see if you can get it on sale because um, as uh, Deepak mentioned, it's uh, 80, uh, the, the high is like at 80 bucks almost, right? So um, right now it's trading at around $34. So with Bitcoin rising, this is for sure going to go up too, as Deepak says. But moving on uh, to my uh, stock pick and um, kind of talked about this in our previous segment when I talked about Polygon and uh, Coinbase, right? How Coinbase is going to leverage Polygon Matic's um, network, um, a blockchain network, right? So um, I think once that becomes official, um, you can see Coinbase, uh, Coinbase stock going up um, because of that news. It'll make it more scalable. It'll make it more scalable and more cheap, and um, the the fees, and then obviously the user usability, right? So just to show our viewers the chart quickly, um, the one day it's um, up three point eight. 3% today. Obviously, markets are closed today, but we'll see how it does tomorrow. But um, let's just quickly look at the five day now. Um, um, it, it like it, it was at 256 and then it's, you see it, see it rise to almost 280 here, right? So um, that that um so at 280 it, it, it's pretty good i think it, it can go it can crack three 300 um if it once this uh news comes out but yeah as crypto continues just to rise um in a bull market more and more users are gonna new users crypto more uh, crypto investors are gonna come on and um sign up for coinbase right 
it's user friendly. So uh, yeah, it's, just keep an eye out on Coinbase. I know I've mentioned the Coinbase doc before, back when it came out in April, and like I mentioned it, I believe a few other episodes back too. But just just a stock to keep in your long term watch list, not just for like one week, but um, weeks ahead as well. All right, so that marks the end of episode thirty. I myself, Syed, and my co-host Deepak would like to thank you for your continuous love and support. Whether you stream the podcast or watch us on YouTube or, or follow us along on our social media journeys. Uh, we did reach um, a milestone here on YouTube, a little milestone, but still great for us as we reached 100 subscribers on YouTube, uh, slowly but surely. Um, and we, we hope to continue this and provide you with great content as we continue to grow and our, con- our content content continues to help you um and educate you and yeah pretty much that's uh, we just wanted to say a little thank you um and we were almost at 10k on t- not, not at 10k followers on tiktok as well so um looking forward to that milestone as well and yeah uh, pretty much so yeah i myself sayed and my co-host deepak would like thank you once again and we'll see you guys in episode 31 next week have a great week y'all Thank you